Hello, everybody. Welcome to the program. Um, we're just going to give it a few minutes and let people get settled in, and then we'll begin. I see somebody has already found the closed captioning. Um, feel free to turn that on. And um, if you have questions, the chat is open. Just make sure that you know who you're chatting with. You can choose host and panelists, or you can choose to share your comments with everyone. As more people are coming into the chat, just or the program, just to let you know, we will be beginning in a few minutes. And um, the chat is open. If you'd like to tell us where you're coming to us from and why you are interested in attending this program, feel free to share that. Just make sure you're uh, chatting with everyone and not just Jamie and myself. Oh, it looks like the chat option is not available. Hmm. Let's see. The Q and A. Hmm. Let's see. I'm going to work on fixing the chat if I can. Um, so give me just one moment. We do have someone from Lowell, Massachusetts. Great. Welcome. Yes, I believe the recording will be available later. I'm sure Jocelyn will explain where to find it. Oh, from Tewksbury. Awesome. 
So I am unsuccessful in editing the chat now that we've started the program. Um, I apologize for that. Um, if you do have a question that you are dying to ask, um, please, as many other people have, utilize the Q&A. As we are getting higher in our numbers, um, figure we should start so we can uh, dedicate the majority of this program to our wonderful presentation. Um, so I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's program, Abolitionist, Abolitions Foot Soldiers, Female Anti-Slavery Societies in Massachusetts. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Gould, and I am the local history and genealogy reference librarian at Reading Public Library in Reading, Massachusetts. Uh, we're very excited about tonight's program and are very excited to be able to share it with libraries across Massachusetts. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by the Reckonings Project, which builds collaborations with community partners, faculty, and students to empower BIPOC communities and residents in the preservation, creation, and curation of their community histories. Uh, you can learn more about the project by visiting uh, www.reckoningsproject.org. You'll uh, notice tonight that uh, we do have the Q&A open. I had hoped to have the chat open. I don't seem to be able to edit that on the fly. Um, but we would love to have your questions um, as you listen to the program. And um, some of them will be answered during the program and others will be answered at the end. Um, we are recording this program and it will be sent out to everyone who signed up for the program at a later date. And um, if you have any suggestions on future programming for um, Reading Public Library to do, uh, just let us know. Um, we are open to all ideas and looking for what you're interested in. So without further ado, um, I believe it's time to introduce our amazing speaker for tonight's program. Uh, Dr. Jamie Crumley is an assistant professor of gender studies and ethnic studies at the University of Utah. She is a 20, 2022 and 2023 research fellow at Old North Illuminated in Boston, Massachusetts. You might have seen her on NECN recently talking about the uh, unique history that Old North Church has. Jamie studies race, gender, and religion in the 18th and 19th century Northeastern United States. Her dissertation, titled Tried as by Fire, Free of African American Women's Abolitionist theologies situates 18th and 19th century black women as proto-black feminist abolitionists who rooted their politics in biblical theology. Jamie has received research fellowships from the Center for the Study of Women at UCLA, the Institute for Citizens and Scholars, the Boston Athenaeum, one of my favorite places to go, and the American Congregational Library. And uh, with that, Jamie, would you like to start sharing your screen and uh, your program for us tonight? Great, I hope that you all can see my screen and please message me in the Q&A if you're having trouble seeing the screen at any point. Thank you so much to everyone who put today's program together. The program was assembled with support from Jocelyn at the Reading Public Library alongside Dr. Cabrera Bumgarner at Northeastern University and Northeastern University's Reckonings Project, which is a group that does powerful community history work in Boston. This evening, I'm gonna speak for about 40 minutes and then we'll have time for questions and answers with Jocelyn will moderate Please feel free to share your questions in the Q&A box anytime during the program. Quote, women were abolition's most effective foot soldiers, end quote. Historian Manisha Senha wrote in her 2016 book, The Slave's Cause. Quote, the best answer to anti-abolitionist violence came from black and white women who marched arm in arm to shield each other from howling mobs during the Boston riots and at Pennsylvania Hall, end quote. The historical record indicates that antebellum Massachusetts was a dangerous place to be an abolitionist. I am pleased to be with you all this evening, right in the middle of Black History Month, to celebrate the stories of some of the Massachusetts 
women who led the struggle to end racial slavery and discrimination against people of color between 1830 and 1860. The rise of interracial female anti-slavery societies was not predetermined as racial segregation was common in the North. Organizations that helped poor, aged, or disabled white women refused to offer services to women of color. Likewise, white women's mutual aid groups did not admit women of color. In response, women of color and their supporters worked to create their own spaces of mutual aid and community support. However, the anti-slavery movement was one of the few places where women collaborated across racial lines. Through anti-slavery activism, women of all races found an unexpected site of social convergence. While these societies were not always racially equitable, they were one of the first times in American history that women tried to engage as supporters and partners with women who did not share their race. During these years called the antebellum period, meaning the period before a war, in this case, the period before the American Civil War, women were vocal participants in the abolitionist cause. Because of the gender norms of the time, middle-class women and men rarely intermixed personally or professionally. Therefore, women formed female anti-slavery societies. They were social and political agitators, and their neighbors didn't like it. Here on the left side of the screen, you'll see snippets of an October 17th, 1835 article from an abolitionist newspaper called The Liberator. The article is detailing mob violence against the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society earlier in the week. The group had scheduled a meeting at the New Jerusalem Church, but the church proprietors refused to open its doors until the women paid them for security. City newspapers continued to report on where the women would be meeting, and a mob found them and attacked them. Again, in November of 1842, female abolitionists were mobbed. Abolitionist newspaper, the Latimer Journal and North Star reported that during an abolitionist meeting during which the group discussed how they could protect fugitives from slavery, people gathered, quote, shouting, yelling, and hissing, end quote, and quote, mobbed a meeting of women. Let's see if I can advance the slide. Okay, perfect. Despite the violence they faced, women in Massachusetts spoke out against slavery. As this image from the 1837 annual report of the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society shows, no less than 32 female anti-slavery societies existed in Antebellum, Massachusetts. The groups had officers, including secretaries who conducted group correspondence. Outside of Massachusetts, women also formed anti-slavery groups. Throughout the antebellum period, women led ladies' anti-slavery societies. These societies promoted the end of slavery and also asserted the importance of women's rights. As you will see throughout this talk, white women were both the victims of misogyny in 19th century Boston and its ironic benefactors. Although 19th century social norms impressed upon women that they must stay in the private sphere of the home, white women understood that they need not comply with that expectation. They used their authority as the caregivers of the younger generations to demand that their voices be heard about the political issues of their time, including slavery. In an 1851 edition of Gleason's Pictorial, Maturin M. Ballou, who would later become the first editor of the Boston Daily Globe, published a poem that he simply called Woman. The poem, which is also displayed on the screen, simultaneously treated white women as mere objects of white male desire and as power players who could turn men to comply with their will. Women were not empowered in 19th century New England, yet as sisters, mothers, wives, and daughters, they harnessed the power of their femininity to shake things up. The interracial group of women who fought to end slavery and promote women's rights, understood the delicate power that they held. 
And when they could, they leveraged that power to affect meaningful social change. They encouraged other women to do likewise. Tonight's talk will be in four parts. Part one is about the racial climate in antebellum Massachusetts. Part two discusses some of the debates and divisions within the antebellum anti-slavery movement. Part three turns to the work of female anti-slavery societies in Massachusetts. Because we have limited time together, I will briefly discuss women's efforts in Salem, Reading, and Boston. Finally, in part four, we will discuss what we can learn from the interracial efforts of the women who participated in anti-slavery groups and how we can implement some of their strategies in contemporary feminist politics. While I will try to cover a lot of ground during this talk, women made so many incredible contributions to the anti-slavery movement between 1830 and 1860, and I cannot talk about it all. On the last slide, I will include a short reading list about books with books about the ante antebellum anti-slavery movement. Before we continue, please note that some of the words or language that we will encounter tonight reflects the spirit of the time in which it was written. Some of what you hear tonight about the history of racial or gender violence in Massachusetts may be upsetting to you. However, it is important for us to immerse ourselves fully in the past, even when doing so makes us feel negative emotions. Part one, race in antebellum Massachusetts. If 18th century Massachusetts was a place where race was constantly made and remade through slavery, colonial violence, and what historian Jared Ross Hardesty has called a culture of dependence, 19th century Massachusetts was a place where ideas about race were becoming much more static. After Massachusetts abolished legal slavery in 1783, it was left to contend with the complex and violent world that its settlers had labeled for, labored for over a century to produce. Although racial slavery was no longer legal in Massachusetts, its white residents continued to benefit from enslaved labor, rapidly eroding native peoples and culture, and anti-Black racism. Massachusetts took the lead on ending slavery, but the state's history post-abolition makes Massachusetts an ideal place to study the incomplete nature of freedom. 19th century Massachusetts was a testing ground for what would be called Jim Crow racism in the early 20th century. Before I continue to tell you about the social climate of antebellum Massachusetts, I want to briefly explain why I wrote the word race between quotation marks on this slide. In the context of my talk this evening, it is important for us to understand race as a social and political invention. The idea of race is not based on biological facts. Rather, the idea of race was created by humans to justify a social structure that privileges some while violating the basic human rights of others. Of course, people have distinctive ethnic and cultural backgrounds, which are to be celebrated, and people have a wide array of skin colors. However, the meaning that has been ascribed to those ethnicities, cultures, and skin colors is what produced racial ideologies. The idea of race has been invented and reinvented multiple times throughout the United States history. And I would venture to say that we are living through a time of painful reinvention right now. At the most basic level in the United States, the racial structure has functioned to displace and disavow even the presence of native or indigenous Americans, use people of black African descent as no wage, low wage, and eventually surplus laborers, and violate the citizenship and labor rights of other people of color as they've immigrated to the United States. Displacement, enslavement, low wage labor, unequal access to healthcare and education, unequitable housing, segregation, even in houses of worship, sexual terror, mass incarceration, and state sanctioned or state pardoned execution that has dogged non white people in American history generally has functioned to cement an idea that so-called white people, which is another invention of people, are superior to groups that are otherwise racialized. Black abolitionist, political preacher, and women's liberation activist, Mariah W. Miller Stewart, spoke to her frustrations about racial discrimination in her essays and political speeches. She encouraged the free Black people who heard her to stand up for themselves and to change their conditions. She urged other people of her race to believe in their ability to determine the future course of their lives. 
They needn't assume a social position that was inferior to white people. Antebellum Massachusetts was a contentious place on issues of race. As historian Joanne Pope Mellish outlines in her monograph, Disowning Slavery, white people in New England have since slavery's abolition worked to characterize slavery in New England as brief or mild, to pretend it never existed, and use methods such as warning people of color to leave particular towns and cities as a way to remove the so-called persistent problem of racial diversity. As Mellish explains, by the 1850s, New England historians had re-envisioned history as a, quote, triumphant narrative of free white labor, a region in which free people of color could be represented as permanent strangers whose presence was unaccountable and whose claims to citizenship were absurd, end quote. Most of antebellum Massachusetts white residents opposed slavery in Massachusetts, but few took issue with the fact that slavery existed elsewhere in the United States. Some wealthy Massachusetts residents owned plantations in the West Indies. They all benefited from goods produced by enslaved laborers. Some Massachusetts re residents, such as Boston-born Unitarian minister, Reverend James Freeman Clark, believed that some enslavers were good people who provided needed care for otherwise helpless Black people. After his graduation from Harvard Divinity School, Clark decided to go west to Kentucky to establish a Unitarian congregation there. In Kentucky, one of his parishioners was a man named Judge Speed. Speed was an enslaver, but Clark writes that Speed did not believe in slavery. However, because Kentucky had not yet abolished slavery, Speed concluded that he should maintain his plantation and care for enslaved people until the state did abolish slavery. Clark supported his Kentucky parishioners and believed with them that their state was ripe for emancipation. While optimism is, of course, a virtue, the historical record reflects that Kentucky was not a state on the brink of immediate emancipation for enslaved peoples. When he returned to Massachusetts, Clark overtly disavowed slavery. However, because of his experience with his Kentucky parishioners, he, quote, made exceptions in the persons of upright, honorable, pure men and women who felt responsibility for the proper, proper care and comfort of their slaves, end quote. At a time when so many people learned of the political issues of their time in houses of worship, the clergy had extraordinary power to shape public opinion about abolition. Instead, most Massachusetts clergy called themselves anti-slavery while maintaining personal and professional relationships with pro-slavery Southern clergy and openly refusing to support fugitives from, slave, from slavery who sought harbor in Boston. When George Latimer, a fugitive from Virginia, asked churches for their prayers of support while he was jailed in Boston awaiting a state, many clergy refused to pray for him, although the abolitionists had ensured that all the churches were aware of his fate. Abolitionists were enraged by the clergy's general apathy about the idea that a man was enslaved in Massachusetts in 1842 and called the state, quote, slave tainted, end quote. In houses of worship, including Quaker houses of worship, the members insisted upon having seating that was segregated by both race and class. While some clergy, including Reverend James Freeman Clark, who pastored Boston's Church of the Disciples, and Reverend William Crosswell, who pastored Boston's Church of the Advent, established their churches to be free of the pew rent that was common in New England churches. Few churches in antebellum Massachusetts were racially integrated and welcoming of all regardless of their financial status. In his 1837 pamphlet, The Negro Pew, New England clergyman and writer Harvey Newcomb railed against both segregated seating in churches and the general maltreatment of Black people in the antebellum period. In the pamphlet, Newcomb noted that, quote, it is often said that the number of colored people or persons in prison is vastly disproportionate to their numbers, but it will be generally found upon examination where this is the case, that most of their crimes are petite larcenies, end quote. Petite larcenies petty crimes. 
Newcomb's defense of Black people who had been jailed for alleged crimes indicates that most people believed that the overrepresentation of Black people in prisons reflected their inferiority. Newcomb thought otherwise. He thought that the disproportionate arrest and incarcerations of Black people were part of an intentional attempt to undermine them on their journey to full freedom. In the 1830s, the free Black population in Boston grew substantially, mostly because of an influx of fugitives from slavery who sought safety on free soil. Some of the individuals who had survived slavery made new lives for themselves in Boston, but were left with the incommensurable pain of family members and friends who were lost to them, either because they had to leave them behind or because they had been sold away and did not know how to reconnect with them. Newly free Black Bostonians were largely segregated in the West End of Boston's Beacon Hill neighborhood. So on one side of the screen, you'll see a large map of Boston and what its neighborhoods looked like in 1855. If you look at the slightly more zoomed in version of the map, you can see Boston a little bit more clearly. Most of the churches and homes where Black people worshiped and lived were located on Southern and Belknap streets, which were just north of the common and south of the county jail. However, some Black Bostonians also lived on Ann Street, which is near Faneuil Hall, in a boarding house for Black sailors. Because there were few lucrative work options, many Black men took to lives at sea where they could earn good money, but it was a dangerous profession. In Boston, free Black people encountered daily insults on the street, dangerous work options, low wages, unequal access to education, and ultimately premature death. Life was similarly challenging further north in Salem. The Salem Female Anti-Slavery Society lamented that a child the society had adopted, a young girl named Henrietta Nichols, had died. Henrietta was the daughter of a fugitive from slavery who was also called Henrietta. After her adoption, the society placed young Henrietta into the Boston San, 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 Samaritan excuse me, Asylum, where she received regular visits from the board. But within six months, she was sick. They could only attribute her death to the neglect that she had experienced before her adoption. Although slavery was not legal in Massachusetts, the state's Black residents were always faced with the devastating effects of it. Part two, debates within the abolitionist movement. As a scholar of religion in American history, I am taken with the varied anti-slavery, pro-slavery, and radical abolitionist political debates that happened among church people in antebellum Massachusetts. As a gender historian, I'm also interested in how women's liberation discourse splintered radical abolitionist political organizing. Therefore, the debates that I will outline over the next several minutes will primarily tend to the religious and early feminist debates within the abolitionist movement. To be clear, these were not the only two debates that were happening, happening within the abolitionist movement in antebellum Massachusetts, but examining these debates in broad strokes allows us to understand the issues that ultimately led to divisions among abolitionists on both sides of the Atlantic. I have yet to find an example of a single Christian group in the United States that was opposed to converting Black and Native peoples to Christianity. However, none of these Christian groups worked collectively toward freedom and justice for marginalized groups. Nevertheless, in 17th and 18th century Massachusetts, there are examples of Native men who served as Puritan ministers. And by the early 19th century, Black men were ministering to Black congregants. Despite the shortcomings of white ministers in New England, Black and Native peoples found ways to adapt Christianity to suit their needs. In 1829, abolitionist David Walker, a Methodist, distributed his appeal to the colored citizens of the world, which was a critique of the American Christians' failure to live up to their Christian ethics. In the appeal, he wrote of Black Americans that they were, quote, the most wretched, degraded, and abject set of beings that ever lived since the world began, and that the white Christians, having reduced us to the state of slavery, treat us in a condition more cruel, they being an enlightened and Christian people, than any heathen nation did any people whom it had reduced to our condition, end quote. 
We will note that in Walker's writing, he drew no distinction between white Christians in different regions. He believed they all had failed in their callings as Christians. New England's nominally anti-slavery Christian ministers disagreed with such an assessment. They believed that the abolitionist movement was led by infidels who wanted nothing more than to destroy the church. In his short tract called The Infidelity of Abolitionism, which he published in The Liberator on December 21st, 1855, William Lloyd Garrison spoke to Christians' fears of the movement. He placed abolitionists within the lineage of prophets, Jesus and the disciples, and radical early church leaders who, understood, um, who were understood to be seditious or blasphemous. He stated that abolitionists had never intended to harm the church. Rather, they had assumed the churches would support their cause. However, Garrison concluded that abolitionists found that, quote, the North was as hostile to emancipation as the South, that the spirit of slavery was omnipresent, invading every sanctuary, infecting every pulpit, controlling every press, corrupting every household, and blinding every vision, that no other alternative was presented to them except to separate themselves from every slave holding alliance, end quote. Walker and Garrison's opinions were clear. They believed that white Northern clergy and congregations valued the opportunity to commune with white Southern clergy and congregations that were pro-slavery. Therefore, they painted the radical politics of abolition that demanded the abolitionists to sever social and political ties with people who were pro-slavery as antithetical to Christian ethics and therefore the problem facing the church. As Garrison succinctly stated it in the pages of the Liberator, his platform was, quote, no union with slaveholders, end quote. Walker and Garrison's contemporaries believed that their politics were a radical approach to abolition that endangered the church, the delicate gender balance, white supremacy, and ultimately the United States as a nation as they pushed not only for the end of slavery, but also for the abolitionist movement to align itself with other social justice issues of the time. It is hard to talk about the Northern abolitionist movement without discussing the Grimke sisters from South Carolina. Sarah Grimke and her younger sister Angelina were born into a Christian slaveholding family. They turned against their family, friends, and religious leaders when they chose to forcibly and publicly speak out against the horrors of slavery and demand its abolition. As women who had been raised with slavery in their household, they could speak unflinchingly of how violent it was. They spoke in especially graphic detail about how violent slavery was for enslaved women and the regime of sexual terror that Black enslaved women suffered. Suffice it to say that the New England establishment disapproved. While the Grimke sisters loom large in the historiography of women in the ab antebellum abolitionist movement, letters exchanged between William Lloyd Garrison and women throughout New England and even in Europe, women whose names are well known, like Harriet Beecher Stowe, and women whose names are lesser known, like Rebecca I. Streeter, reflects the deep friendships and camaraderie that Garrison shared with women throughout the 19th century. It is clear that Garrison supported women who wanted to make their political opinions known. However, not all women agreed with Garrison that it was wise to align anti-slavery and women's liberation politics. Notably, Black abolitionist Frederick Douglass was passionate about keeping these issues separate from one another, and he insisted that slavery's abolition be first. Although some of the most strident critiques of anti-slavery women came from within the anti-slavery movement, anti-slavery women were undaunted, and boldly spoke publicly before audiences of men and women about political issues. In response, they faced some of the violent reactions that I spoke about earlier in the talk. In response to the Grimke sisters, an outspoken French orator named Fanny Wright, Mariah W. Stewart, and other female anti-slavery speakers, the ministers who belonged to the General Association of Massachusetts wrote an open, pastoral letter to lay people in their state in 1837 during a, a meeting at North Brookfield, Massachusetts. The ministers wrote in the letter that they were, quote, compelled to mourn over the loss and a degree of that deference of the pastoral office, end quote. They wrote of a certain moral, of certain moral reform topics, which they asserted were preached from the pulpit without the minister's consent. However, they then turned to their most rigorous critique. Their letter is definitive. 
They would not tolerate so-called reformers preaching from their pulpits without their permission. However, what becomes more apparent as the letter continues is that their problem was not with an ungendered mass of reformers, but rather with women reformers, who they believed stood to upend the delicate social order that depended upon old adult women's naive and childlike subservience. The ministers wrote that, quote, the power of a woman is in her dependence, flowing from the consciousness of that weakness which God has given her for her protection, and which keeps her in those departments of life that form the character of individuals and of the nation. There are social influences which females use in promoting piety and the great objects of Christian benevolence that we cannot too highly commend, end quote. They explained that women were welcome to serve in the church as Sunday school leaders and by encouraging people who were curious about religion to speak to their minister. However, they explain that, quote, when she assumes the place and tone of as a man, as a public reformer, our care and production of her seem unnecessary. We put ourselves in self-defense against her. She yields the power which God has given her for protection and her character becomes unnatural, end quote. They went on to condemn anyone who empowered women to believe that they had the right to speak publicly as social reformers. Before we launch into our discussion of three of the many female anti-slavery societies in antebellum Massachusetts, I do wanna explain my use of the word feminist to describe activist women in antebellum America. Using that term to describe women in early America is controversial among historians because the formal inauguration of the women's rights movement did not happen until the meeting at Seneca Falls in 1848. However, historians such as Ruth Bogan and Jean Fagan Yellen have argued definitively that anti-slavery women created an ideology that was both abolitionist and that furthered women's rights. While this history is thorny because it's tangled up with middle-class white women of the 19th century who incorrectly described the conditions facing white women in the United States as being akin to the positionality of enslaved people. We must place these women into the long history of feminism in the United States. To be clear, there have been and continue to be many ideologies of feminism in the United States. And the complications within 19th century feminism are fascinating because they allow us to contend with the complications of 21st century feminism. I will return to this subject a little bit later in the talk. Part three, feminist abolitionism in antebellum Massachusetts. Although Christian ministers condemned women's work as social reformers, the women of anti-slavery groups believed that being part of these groups was a reflection of their Christian convictions. Furthermore, the women of these groups never pursued a single issue approach to politics. As women, they could not ignore the political issues of women's rights. As some of them were Black women, they also could not ignore the problems of anti-Black discrimination. As sisters and mothers, they could not ignore issues of social class and impending war and public education. The records of the female anti-slavery societies indicate that Massachusetts anti-slavery women were well connected with each other and with other anti-slavery groups throughout the state, the region, and across the ocean, as this quote from Angelina Grimke about the influence of British women on the abolition of slavery in the British colonies shows. As we turn to the work of three of the anti-slavery societies in antebellum Massachusetts, I have placed a map on the screen that depicts Massachusetts in 1838. This map will give you an idea of the state's different regions. As you can see, the reason why there were so many anti-slavery societies in Massachusetts is because abolitionists in each region needed to be prepared to deal with a culture that was increasingly hostile to the rights of Black people. Although it is clear that Massachusetts abolitionists strongly believed in the importance of working locally to push toward the goal of slavery's abolition, no group worked in a vacuum. Each of the state's anti-slavery societies did what it could to financially support each other and to amplify each other's work in their writings. Consistently across female anti-slavery groups, women relied on prayer and scripture. Although their ministers called them a threat to the Christian establishment, the women's sense of devotion to their Christian faith indicates that they earnestly believed that based on the messages of love and salvation they learned in the church, that their ministers would be eager to support them. 
I will now discuss the work that women did in female anti-slavery societies in Salem, Reading, and Boston. Salem, Reading, and Boston are all in Eastern Massachusetts and therefore could connect with each other and, and other anti-slavery groups with ease, relative ease. We'll start with Salem. On November 8th, 1832, William Lloyd Garrison received a brief letter from Salem. The letter writer had recently seen Garrison when he had visited Salem. In his address, Garrison had incorrectly stated that there were no anti-slavery societies in Massachusetts that were led by Black people. The author had includes, enclosed the constitution of an organization which had formed in February of 1832. The group was called the Salem Female Anti-Slavery Society. The group's brief constitution clarified that the group was managed by women of color in Salem, Massachusetts. In the group's constitution, the women indicated their belief that Garrison's newspaper, The Liberator, had been effective in teaching people both about the horrors of slavery and the United States government scheme to send freed Black people to colonies in the Caribbean and West Africa. The society was to be supported by voluntary contributions. The funds would be used to purchase books, and when the group had a surplus of funds, the money would go to support people in need. The meetings of the society were to commence and conclude with prayer and singing. When any member of the group was speaking, they were to be allowed to continue without interruption. The group also had a plan to expel members who failed to conform to the society's rules. The Salem group was an outgrowth of an active community of Black activists in Essex County, Massachusetts. Today in Salem, historians and community activists are working diligently to shine light on and preserve this important history. However, it is no wonder that this part of Salem's history is often overlooked today. Garrison's idea that there were no Black-led anti-slavery societies in the region reflects the fact that Black activists were being undermined and overlooked, even as they did the work of trying to secure Black freedom. Despite the slights, the group carried on, supporting a school for Black girls, supporting a sewing school for Black children, and helping other female anti-slavery societies in the region, inviting guest speakers and lecturers, supporting the work of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, and advocating for the immediate abolition of slavery in the nation's capital. The Salem group sometimes included generations of women from the same family who all shared a commitment to slavery's abolition. Generational involvement is a reminder that the struggle to abolish slavery was long, arduous, and personal. The Salem group was active and over the course of time made a name for themselves in the anti-slavery struggle. On October 2nd, 1854, Rebecca Ives Streeter wrote to William Lloyd Garrison from Salem. The tone of her letter indicates that while Garrison might not have known about the group when he visited Salem in 1832, he no doubt knew of the group by 1854. Streeter wrote to invite him to be a speaker at their annual meeting at Lyceum Hall. She felt sure that he must be aware of their meetings, but in case he was not, she clarified that there would be 10 lectures to begin in October. The work of the Salem Female Anti-Slavery Society indicates that women of color were leaders in Massachusetts antebellum anti-slavery movement. Moving along to Reading, the women of Reading, Massachusetts formed their anti-slavery society on March 21st, 1833. Like the Salem group, the Reading Female Anti-Slavery Society had a constitution which explained the reason for their formation. The group's constitution explained that slavery was contrary to Christianity, dangerous to national liberties, and ought to be abolished. Their justification for their work is not unlike that of other anti-slavery groups that centered a Christian ethical framework as a justification for their relentless pursuit of their work. Like the Salem anti-slavery group, the Reading group also regularly co collected funds to support William Lloyd Garrison's work. At their October 29, 1833 meeting, the Reading Female Anti-Slavery Society discussed the plight of enslaved women. Their meeting notes say that they, quote, view with compassion the female slave, mourn over her moral degradation, lament her intellectual and physical debasement, and lift our hearts in fervent aspirations that he who is, quote, the father of the fatherless, end quote, will deliver her out of the hands of her enemies, end quote. It is probably unsurprising that a group of female activists were concerned with the plight of women in slavery. 
But their particularity about the distinct struggles of enslaved women points to a shifting tide in antebellum anti-slavery activism. To use the sight of Black women's brutalized bodies and diminished spirits to compel those who were apathetic about slavery to act. As society shifted toward an ideal of female protection, it appalled anti-slavery women that Black enslaved women were unprotected. Antebellum anti-slavery activists in the United States would have seen images like this one that was printed in London in 1792 as a critique of the terrors of the slave trade. In the image, a barely clad black enslaved woman hangs upside down by one ankle aboard the deck of a ship. One well-dressed white man holds onto the rope, muttering under his breath of his desire to let the rope go. Two other white men stand a little further off, gossiping about the horrific affair. On the other side of the woman whose face is concealed is Captain Kimber. Kimber is dressed to reflect his station and he holds a whip in his hand, which we presume he will use to harm the enslaved woman. His face is crinkled in an expression of almost childlike amusement. Three naked women are featured in the back of the image. There are no thought bubbles to elucidate their inner thoughts, but their facial expressions betray their terror and their wide-eyed looks as their brutalized friend and at each other indicates their feelings of connection and sisterhood with each other. While slavery in the British Atlantic world rendered Black enslaved women to be the natural reproducers of additional unfree people, it also ironically shifted understandings of the meaning of the word woman that led white Northerners and especially white Northern women to declare that slavery was evil. White Christian mothers did not want their children to believe that the brutal treatment of Black women and children was acceptable. Meanwhile, many free Black women were appalled because they knew that so long as slavery persisted, their children were at risk. Now we'll turn to Boston. I began my talk this evening by telling you about the mob violence that abolitionist women experienced in Boston. The Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society was founded in October of 1833. Like other anti-slavery societies, the group formed because of a sense of Christian duty to overthrow slavery. In 1834, the group, which was then led by Mary S. Parker, wrote a document called Address of the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society to the Women of New England. In the document, they described themselves as the descendants of pilgrims who sought, who ought to cherish American free, or Christian freedom. They explained their political event agenda, first to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, and second to forbid Texas from joining the Union since slavery was still legal in Texas. The group's members presented themselves as political theorists who understood that governmental representation was based on the number of people in the population regardless of sex, and that as women, they did, they did not want the men in their family to be fighting a war to defend Texas. They also feared the chaos at the southern border would inspire enslaved people to take advantage of the chaos and to shed the blood of their enslavers. The group implored every woman who encountered their address to create a, pet a petition and go door to door inviting her neighbors to sign it and urge the United States government to abolish slavery in Washington, DC and not allow Texas to join the union. The group's actions indicate that for them, abolition was more than a sentiment or a frivolous hobby. They devoted their time to overturning it. Like the Salem Female Anti-Slavery Society, the Boston group was also invested to educating young people. Unlike the Salem group that donated money to support schools that educated Black children, the Boston group provided children with religious education about the horrors of slavery. The image that you see on your screen was produced by the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society and it's called Aurelia. Aurelia are facts, objects, or materials from everyday life that can be used as teaching aids. 
This realia is called the captive and it is on linen. It contains stories, scriptures, poetry, and a short song that explain that some people were enslaved, that slavery must end, and that children had a part to play in ending slavery. Part four, what feminist abolitionism teaches us. In the antebellum period, women understood their political power. Although political power manifested in different ways for women depending on their race, the record is clear that women were not apathetic or silent about the issue of slavery. Many abolitionist women also gestured toward an analytic framework that contemporary feminists call intersectionality that is a matrix of multiple forms of inequality. These matrices can be mutually reinforcing, but they also can raise specific problems for individuals who sit at the nexus of gender, ethnicity, disability, class, and age. In the 19th century, American feminists encountered a problem that continues to plague American feminists. That is, how can we unite around the problems we share, patriarchy and sexism, while also recognizing that some problems we do not share, but nonetheless must stand together to dismantle. While the women of the antebellum Massachusetts female anti-slavery societies were not perfect activists, I hope that we can take a few lessons from them. First, they teach us to engage in local organizing efforts. When I use the word local, I refer of course to our neighborhoods, towns, and cities. However, the word local can also refer to a geographical space that is much smaller than the town or neighborhoods where we live. Our work begins in our homes, in our families, and in our friend groups. The women of antebellum female anti-slavery societies knew that they had power as sisters, daughters, cousins, mothers, and friends to affect change, and they did. Second, build a community of like-minded activists beyond the, the, place, the local places you serve. Every female anti-slavery society had a corresponding secretary. The secretaries were aware of each other. In Massachusetts and throughout the North and even in England, the women constantly corresponded and built a sense of community. They learned that the demands of women were different in Reading than they were in Bristol, England. Yet they also learned that there was strength in numbers and they supported each other. The third lesson is to show your work. So many of us make the mistake of, of failing to take careful notes about who we are, what we believe in and what we do. The notes you take are important now for people who want to join you in the work you do. The notes you take will be important a few years from now as people want to take up the work that you do. And the notes you take will be important to future generations of activists who need to feel inspired and to feel less alone in their political challenges and need a roadmap as they try to make the world better. When I think about the female anti-slavery societies of antebellum Massachusetts, I am inspired. I am not necessarily inspired simply because they existed, because we know that women have always done important political work. But what inspires me is that so many of them lasted for more than 25 years in a nation that was increasingly hostile to women's activism and anti-slavery work. By the cusp of the Civil War, there were women who, despite the pressures to return to their homes and stop agitating for immediate emancipation, had labored for more than 30 years around this single cause. These women did as much as their male counterparts did to overthrow slavery in the United States. Thank you all so much for joining me this evening as we've talked about female anti-slavery societies in antebellum Massachusetts. Before we transition into the Q&A, which Jocelyn will moderate, I do want to offer this short reading list if you want to learn more about New England's abolitionist history. You can write down these titles on a sheet of paper or take a quick picture of the screen. I've listed some of the classic works in the field, um, but there are other newer books and other books, of course, that are left off this list. I'm happy to make more recommendations if you contact me. And of course, there are a lot of librarians here with us today who also can make recommendations. And so with that, we can turn to Q&A, and I thank all of you very much for joining me this evening for this conversation. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Crumley for a great talk about some of our local uh, 
women who try to help change history. Um, we do have one question so far um, that I think is is really partially about um, how these societies interacted, but also um, partially how you discovered some of your work. So, you know, how you said that you should show your work um, if you can do that for us. So the question is, what is the evidence that female anti-slavery societies in Massachusetts were well connected with each other? Was it just through hearing about each other's activities in the Liberator, or is there evidence of some of these groups being directly in touch with each other outside of rare conferences or other organized multi-organized organization activities? Great, thank you for the question. I'm, where did the question go? It has left my screen. It's I'm in the dismiss. Sorry. Okay, perfect. Or no, answered. Yes, it's in the bottom of the answered section. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna look at it so I can answer all the parts. Um, so the female anti-slavery societies, we see women writing letters to each other, um, especially writing letters to Boston, of course, because here in Massachusetts, of course, that's kind of the center of a lot of abolitionist activity. Um, there was a woman, um, Mary Chapman, who um, led a lot of uh, activist work here in the Boston area, worked closely with William Lloyd Garrison, and we see a lot of women writing letters to her. But we also see the letter women writing letters to each other, not just to other women in their group, but to um, you know women in other female anti-slavery slavery groups. And I'm also just always really excited to see the way that these groups were transnational. Um, they wrote, of course, to women in other parts of the North, but they also were really well connected and inspired by the women in England and had active correspondence with them because, of course, the women in England had inspired the end of the slave trade even sooner than women were able to do in the United States. I'm, I'm, so yeah, so they, they definitely heard about each other in The Liberator. All of them were big fans of William Lloyd Garrison's work and they were reading the newspapers um, and uh, again, holding conferences together. I hope that answers that question. I think everybody should be a big fan of William Lloyd Garrison personally. Um, and if you have never heard anything about him, um, he is an amazing uh, person and ally to the black community here, especially in Massachusetts. Um, let's see, we have another question. Um, were most of these women married? Do we know what type of support the husbands provided or discouraged? And were there single women who were involved? Okay, um, that's a great question. I um, maybe I should show my screen again if I can find the right slide. Um, let's see. Here we go. So I'm going to show this screen again. Sorry, bear with me. There's like always so many things open when you try to do Zoom. I'm. Um, let's look at this screen. And so I hope you all can see this um, or you will be able to see it in a second. It sometimes takes a little bit of time. So we can see if we look at the anti-slavery societies of women in Massachusetts, which with the names of their secretaries. Of course, this is not the names of all the women in the group, but these were the corresponding secretaries. So we see a mix of women who are married. I'm like Mrs. Susan Johnson, Mrs. Gilman Jones, obviously that's a husband's name, Mrs. Ebenezer, Ebenezer Hayward. But then we also see a mix of women who it looks like they were not married. Um, so Miss Betsy Linscott, we see Miss Harriet Minot, we see Miss Abby Kel Kelly, I think that says Kelly, um, Miss Abby Pitts. And so there's a good mix of women um, who were unmarried and also women who were married. One thing that we see that's really exciting in Salem, which I alluded to, um, is that we see multiple generations of women who are involved in the anti-slavery work. So for example, the Redmond woman, women, like through the generations, they were involved in anti-slavery work. We see something really ha similar happening in Philadelphia with the Fortin women, um, where James Fortin was a big abolitionist in Philadelphia. And then we also see his wife and his daughters also involved. Um, those are Black, that was a Black, free Black family, and they were also involved in abolitionist work. And so it's a mix of women. Um, and so I think that's always something that's really exciting to see the way that some of the, in some cases, the entire family was involved in anti-slavery work and women stayed in the work for generations. But then of course, there are also examples of women who once they were married, fell off from the work. So it's a good mix of different types of women who were eager and excited to be part of this work. 
I think yes, I love that William Lloyd Garrison quote. I will be I heard. I will be heard. No, um, he was he was uh, quite a guy. <laughs> um, let's see. We're oh, and this was where my brain was going. Thank you, Matthew. Um, were these women um, who were involved in the abolition movement involved in other reform efforts like suffrage for women? Yeah, so a lot of the women who we see involved in the anti-slavery movement were extremely involved in what we today would call feminism, and they were definitely, they, they believed in tackling multiple issues at the same time, and so they saw issues of anti-Black racism and women's rights as being deeply connected issues, um, and that became a problem time and time again because there were some male abolitionists who thought it was really important to keep these issues separate or who didn't believe in women's rights at all. So for example, Frederick Douglass did believe in women's rights and we see him working really actively alongside women and working alongside women suffragists, you know, well into the 19th century. However, he did not want abolition and anti-Black racism and Black men gaining their citizenship considered alongside the issue of women's suffrage. But then, of course, there were also men who believed slavery was wrong, but believed that women didn't need to be liberated. And that comes up, of course, in the case of a lot of the congregational ministers who I was talking about, who really believed um, that slavery was wrong, but did not want to uh, do anything to mess with the delicate gender balance at the time. Yes, and this is when people are interesting and multifold um, is a good thing to remember. Um, Tammy asks, my favorite resource specifically for the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society is the book To Set This World Right by Sandra Petri Leonis. But I noticed it wasn't on your last slide. Any critical or additional thoughts about that group in Concord? I believe that you probably have more information, Tammy, than I do about the Concord group. I've done a lot of work mostly on the women who are on the eastern side of the state. I'm so yeah, there were female anti-slavery societies everywhere who were all doing just such incredible work. And like I said, at the start of the talk, there's like, it's almost impossible to kind of get to all of them. So thank awesome. you for that other book recommendation though. That's great. Um, and I think this will be our last question and it's, it's mine. Um, if we could learn about one uh, Black woman during this Black History Month, who would you recommend and why? I'm um, so here in Massachusetts, the woman who I, I guess probably inspired all the work that I've done over the past um, extended period of years is Mariah Miller Stewart, who I talked about a little bit in the talk, um, who was the first American woman of any race to address what they called in the 19th century a promiscuous audience, <laughs> which just means that there were both men and women. Um, who were in the audience. She spoke with, um, uh, and, you know, she's published in The Liberator. She had a lot of support from William Lloyd Garrison, um, but she also, um, after she leaves Boston, continues to work as an educator in uh, New York. She works in Washington, D.C., um, is supporting a lot of Black Episcopal churches, um, both in New York and in Washington, D.C., and so I think she's just a really exciting example of just how multifaceted 19th century Black women were. Um, so she's always my pick for us to learn more about. Mine personally is Harriet Hayden. Um, if you don't know Harriet Hayden and her husband, Lewis, um, you can learn a lot about them along the Black Heritage Trail. And I will put in a plug for a Tewksbury program next month. Um, one of them, um, it's a series about the National Parks of Massachusetts, and one of them is to explore the Black Heritage Trail. If you've never done it, it's a really amazing uh, trail to do, either on your own or with a guide from the National Park Service. Um, and um, with that, I will extend my thanks once again to Dr. Crumley um, and also to the Reckonings Project for their amazing help tonight and all of you who came and joined us. We will be sending out the uh, recording and I will make sure to include the links and also Dr. Crumley's list of suggested readings. Um, and I look forward to seeing you at our programming in the future. So have a great night. And thank you once again for coming. Thank you.